Old School RuneScape, Tombs of a Mascot tutorial. So this is going to be a video on how to complete the raid Tombs of a Mascot, or TOA. And I'm hopefully going to explain a whole bunch of things that I just didn't think existed in other tutorial videos, and also wanted to show methods on how we can get through the raids on normal difficulty, so that's 150 Invocation, without having to do, to do anything crazy. So let's get started. We're going to start with the quest that we need. We have to complete Beneath Cursed Sands, so you can go through and see what you need to do to finish that. And then we need to get there. So if we come to the map and we go all the way down to the bottom of the desert, we can see there's a fairy ring. We can use this fairy ring to jump across the rocks. And then we can run through Necropolis to get into the pyramid here. And this is where the Tombs of a Mascot Raid is. So I'm going to do that, but I'm going to speed this part up because it's kind of dry. Now we're ready to get started. Let's talk a little bit about this room here. So we have a camel bank that allows you to access your bank. We have the obelisk, the grouping obelisk in the center of the room. This is where you're going to set up your invocations and also set up your party. The scoreboard lets you see scoreboard info about the raid, and this is how we enter the raid. Those chests over there is how you're going to claim your items on death. I think that's that chest, and this chest is where your raid items go if you didn't pick them up when you finish the raid. So we're not really going to worry about those too much. Let's go to the obelisk, and let's click on make a party. You have to do this every time before you enter. And if you are going to be doing this with a group, you're going to have to refresh this on the applicants page and click your friend's name so you can let them in. The members tab will let you see all the people inside of your raid. And the invocations is where you're going to set up your raid level. The invocations tab is where you're going to adjust your raid level. By default, it'll start at zero, which is entry mode, and you have to get your raid level to 150 for normal and I think 300 for expert. We're going to stick with normal though, and the invocations themselves are just challenges that make the raid harder. So for example, quiet prayers means that your prayers are 10% less effective within the raid, and they increase your raid level by 20. If I turn it off, you see it goes into entry mode. If I turn it on, it goes back up to normal. These are the invocations that I suggest. You can read through these if you want to, and you can try to disable some that you really think you won't like, or you can turn other ones off or on if you think that you can do them a little bit better. But for the most part, these are a good combination that, in my opinion, you're not really going to notice very much. Like the quiet and deadly prayers, you're not going to notice those very much. And if you aren't, don't know a whole lot about the raid right now, which if you're watching this video, I assume you don't, then I would just not really bother, I would just trust me bro and send these, and if you follow the rest of the video, you'll be able to get through it just fine. I want to talk a little bit about Walk the Path. I see this one suggested pretty often for new raiders, and I don't really know why. So what it does is it boosts your raid level by 50, which is big, that's super helpful, but it also causes all the other paths to randomly level up as you complete one inside the raid. So what this means is when you complete a path, another one will get harder. And that's fine, it's actually not that much more difficult. The problem is that it just takes a lot longer, because the boss in that upgraded path is going to have way more health, and the fight just takes way too long, especially for a beginner. So I think you're going to be better off keeping that one off and turning on the other invocations that don't adjust the level of the raid, except beyond the invocation level, what it's currently doing right now. Because we just don't want the raid to take any more time than it has to while we're learning it. Once you've learned it, once you've learned the mechanics, you can do whatever you want. That's my suggestion on the invocations. As you learn more about the raid, you'll be able to turn these on and off, pick combinations that you feel better with, and maybe even start pushing toward expert a lot sooner than you might think. The old school wiki on the Tombs of a Mascot strategies page under the equipment section has a pretty good section and tabs on the gear that you should be bringing into the raid. So for the melee section, we're mostly concerned with the middle columns here, and same with ranged and magic, because there's some pretty big leaps in prices from Bandos to Torva or Arims to Ancestral. But for me, Lee, some of the things you are going to want to try to max out, you'll be much happier with the Fang than you would be with the Hosta, but if you absolutely can't afford the Fang, you'll be fine with the Hosta. And that goes for pretty much all the gear setups. So if we scroll down here to the inventory section, you'll notice we pretty much want three full melee, not melee, but three full gear swaps for the different combat styles. So we want melee, 
ranged and magic combat styles with some space for some supplies. Now this one confuses me a little bit, this main setup, because they seem to suggest that you'll have the Charis Partisan of Breaching before you'll have the Divine Rune Pouch. I think that's unlikely, but I guess anything's possible. So if we look at the gear that I'm bringing in here, it's pretty similar to what they have. For the melee gear, if you can't afford the face guard, don't worry, bring the regular helmet. If you can't afford primordials, just bring dragon boots, you'll be fine. Instead of Arata's Blessing, because I'm assuming you're not going to have a Bofa if you're watching this video, then you'll want to bring a Dragon Crossbow with Ruby Bolts and the best melee or the best range gear that you can afford. And for magic, I think everything here is pretty accessible to most people. The Elendis Ward might be a little expensive and the Imbued God Capes are pretty annoying, but for the most part that's pretty accessible. And that's kind of the point I'm trying to get across here is you don't have to bring this gear that I have that's a little bit expensive. Like I have an Avernic, you don't need that, just bring a Dragon Defender. I hope that point is getting across. You don't have to bring out maxed out gear to succeed in this raid, especially on normal difficulty. For our supplies, don't worry too much about bringing a whole lot in there. When you're learning the raid, you're going to die a lot. You're learning the mechanics, and every time you die, the raid is going to give you some honey locusts, which are ketchup food. So you're going to have a stackable set of honey locusts that will give you health, prayer, and stat restore, and run energy. So you don't really have to worry about running out of food in there. And if you worry about bringing in your resources, you're just going to blow through a ton of them. That's okay. That's normal. That's part of raiding. The whole purpose right now, if this is your first time, is just to finish the raid. That's all you need to focus on. You are going to want to bring a dragon dagger. If you don't want to worry about specking things, just don't bring a spec weapon. A Bandos God Sword is a really good spec weapon. It does a lot of damage. It lowers our defense. But if you don't want to worry about specking, don't bring a spec weapon. And if you don't have another spec weapon, then you'll want to replace my light bearer with a something like a berserker ring. If you don't want to worry about thralls or barrages, don't bring a rune pouch. Bring something else, okay? Now, as far as gear upgrades go, a good rule of thumb to go off of is if that gear, if that piece of gear increases your maximum hit, it's an upgrade and you should bring it. Hopefully this will get you started, but really you do not have to spend hundreds of mil to complete this raid. And I guess I'm not showing that because this is the gear that I'm using, but pretty much everything I'm doing in this video is perfectly fine on the lower step of all the gear that you see in my bank tab right here. Oh, and I should bring up the antidote you don't need if you want to bring a serpentine helmet. There are, I think, about three places in the raid that will poison you. As you get better at it, you won't even need the antidote at all, so it's up to you if you want to bring one. But you'll want a full antidote because you can get venomed and that needs two antidote doses to get rid of. The other poison in the raid is just regular poison and one of them doesn't even do that much damage, but I'll talk more about that as we get there. When it comes to Runelite plugins, I tend to like to keep mine to a pretty bare minimum. I'm weird like that, but there are some really helpful ones. So you probably should know how to use Runelite a little bit by now, but I'm going to pretend like you don't. So if we come up here, we're going to click on the wrench so we can get to the configuration menu. And this configuration menu will show all of your currently installed and enabled plugins. And then the plugin hub is where you can search for new ones. So the only plugins you're going to need for the purpose of my video is the Tombs of a Masket plugin and the Tombs of a Masket puzzle helper. I'll have these listed in the description. And then another helpful one is the menu swapper, so the menu entry swapper. What this allows you to do is change the shift and the left click options on different items. So for example, the Dwarven Rock Cake guzzle is not default for left click, but with the menu entry swapper I can hold shift and then right click over an item. I can hold shift and then right click over an item and it will allow me to swap the left and the shift click. This will come in handy later on in the video and I'll show why later. And then for tile packs, there's two that are helpful. So if we click on the tile packs, which you might have to get this as a separate add-on, I can't remember. Uh, but if you click on the tile pack, little square option, menu option there, there's a search bar. We can search TOA, TOA. And there's two that I'm going to need for the video. That's going to be the Akka puzzle room and the Zabak puzzle room. I think I have another tile pack for Zabak, but this one will work just fine. That should be all the plugins. If I forgot anything or if I change my mind, they will be in the description of the video.
There's a couple of prep steps we can take, but I recommend this for when you get more experience with the raid, and it doesn't really matter when we're learning how to do it for the first time. But right before you head in there, you could drink like a ranging potion, or a divine super ranging potion, or a divine super combat. But since we're mostly concerned with learning the raid, we're not really going to worry about that too much. So we're all geared up. We're going to just make sure that we have all of our right gear swaps. Everything is equipped, and I've got runes in my rune pouch. I'm on the right spell book if I'm using thralls, or I would be if I'm using barrage. Make sure you're on ancients. And I have the potions that I need. Some brews, some restores, super combat, antidote, and spec weapons. We're okay. We're going to click on the obelisk, click on my party, that'll create our party, make sure our invocations are actually set to 150, and then we're going to head on inside. Now that we're in this room, we can see the four different pathways that will lead us to the puzzle rooms and the bosses of the four main bosses in the raid. And if we turn the camera around, we see this entryway that will open up once all four of these bosses are defeated, and that will lead to the final boss, which is kind of like three bosses all mashed together into one. And one thing to keep in mind is that if you're struggling with a pathway, you don't have to do the whole raid to practice that boss. It does not matter what order you do the bosses in. It's kind of up to you, so when you get more experience with the raid, you'll probably want to go for the pathway that you hate the most, just to get it out of the way. But if you really find that you're struggling against the Bach or the Monkey Room, you can just come in here, practice that one pathway, and ignore everything else. Don't expect to get a raid clear your first time. Maybe you do. If you do, that's awesome. But if you don't, don't worry about it. You can keep trying it, and you will pick it up. It will make sense, and it'll get really easy before long. So to describe the different pathways, this is the monkey room with Baba, this is the bug room with Kefri, the skeleton room, I guess, with Akka, and the crocodile room, I don't know, something like that, with uh, Zabak, the crocodile guy. The order I'm going to be completing the raid in is monkey, bug, skeleton, crocodile. And I'm also going to be doing the rest of this raid with my friend Spank My Mango. The reason for that is because there are a couple of mechanics with a group that you're not going to see solo, so I think it's a really good idea to see all the group mechanics, because if you can handle those, you can handle them solo, no problem. Keep in mind, if you try to leave the raid early, you will forfeit the whole raid. If you try to leave one of these pathways early, once you start one, then you will have to redo the whole raid if you leave it before you finish that pathway. You have to finish the whole raid in one sitting. You can't kill three bosses and then log out and come back to it later. Let's get started! We're going to choose the monkey room first, because it sucks. Whichever pathway you decide to do first, each one of them, including the boss rooms, will have this little entrance room that you will respawn in if you die. Assuming you haven't turned on any limited death invocations, you can die an unlimited number of times while you're learning the raid. The more times you die, the less points you get, and if you have too few points, you're not going to get any drops when you clear the raid, but right now your chief concern should be learning the mechanics and finishing the raid and not really worrying about the drops. The monkey room itself either goes really well or really badly, so you'll want to pick up a hammer and this cleansing potion from the crates outside of the room and drop any supplies if your inventory is full in the entrance room. If you drop them inside the room past this little firewall and if you die inside the room, those supplies will be lost, but they'll still be there in the entrance room if you leave them there. So there's three main monkeys we're concerned about, the Brawler, Thrower, and the Mage Monkeys, and I have a list on the right side there that tells you which monkeys come in which wave. The amount of the monkeys is wrong, but the types of monkeys seems to be correct. Whoever has Sight, which is going to be a monkey skull that's floating above that person's head, usually the first person to walk into the room, they are, are, they are going to see monkey skulls either above the vents or on the pillars, or the other player, if you're playing with someone else, is going to glow dark, and you're going to have to stand on the other player to cleanse them with a potion, or you'll have to stand on the vent to cleanse the vent, or you'll have to repair the pillar with the hammer. So my friend there, he just ran on top of me because he has sight and he saw that I needed to be cleansed, and after a couple of monkey mechanics, it will switch the sight to me, 
and that'll be set, told down in the uh, chat box there. And if you have your sounds on, which I do, but I muted them because I messed up the audio for this video, then you'll be able to hear the different noises that the room makes. So I do suggest that you keep your sounds on while you're doing this raid. It helps out a lot in the long run. So right there, I have sight. We can see the monkey skulls on the pillars. And we'll see those same skulls on the vents if we're supposed to cleanse the vents. And if my friend is supposed to be the one who's cleansed, he will glow a dark color. The other three types of monkeys we have to worry about are the shamans, which summon these little thralls that are following me right now, and the cursed monkeys, which don't attack you but they dump poison on the ground, and then the explosive or the volatile monkeys that will slowly approach one of you and then blow up in a 3x3 radius. You just step away from those ones. The cursed and the shaman monkeys seem to be pretty weak to range, so that's what we use to take them out. I tend to focus those as quickly as I can and then I worry about the Com the other combat monkeys, but the order you want to do that in is kind of up to you. Just keep in mind that in my experience, especially when you're learning this raid, you're probably just going to have a million little thrall monkeys on you, and that's just something you're going to have to deal with. So here the vents are glowing, and especially if you're playing with a friend, you have to communicate what's going on. They can't see that they're supposed to cleanse the vents. You have to tell them, hey, we have to cleanse the vents. And like I said, this room either goes super smooth or really badly. When you do it a couple of times, you'll kind of learn what's taking you out and what you're having a hard time with. One thing I strongly recommend is that you try your best to pray against the damage that you're taking and do not worry about switching all of your combat style equipment. Just switch your weapons. And you'll want to make sure you're hitting the, we the monkeys with the weapons that they're weak to. So hit the brawlers with magic, hit the throwers with range or mage. Melee? That one, got it. Hit the throwers with melee and hit the mages with ranged. It'll be a lot easier, it'll go a lot smoother that way. And finally, when no more monkeys are spawning and we just have these thralls to deal with, we are finally done with the room. And this one went pretty smooth. I took a little bit of damage that I didn't need to, but that's okay. So now we're going to run back once the room is clear and we're going to pick up our resources, which I almost forgot. And I need to heal up. If you're learning the raid and you're dying a bunch of times, you don't really need to worry about expending your resources. Just use the honey locusts. But if you're trying to get through this without using any honey locusts with minimal deaths, which should eventually be your goal, then I find usually I have to use at least one Cerebrew and three Super Restore doses once I'm done with this room. Next is Baba, who is a lot less stressful. Any health and prayer that we lost in the monkey room, I'm going to restore here. And if this is your first time learning Baba, then you might just want to throw yourself into there and die or just see how far you get and use the honey locust. We also get all of our run energy restored when we join the room. That's why we don't need staminas. And if you brought something like a super combat, then you can use it before you go in. We're going to run in and switch to our spec weapon if we brought one, otherwise we'll just start meleeing him and protect from melee, and melee attacks are the only thing we have to do against Baba. We're going to stay south down here. This seems to summon less baboons, and I actually don't get any baboons summons in this entire fight. But I'll talk about those in a second. His main two mechanics are those shadows, that shadow AoE that pops up, you want to run away from that. And then he'll drop these boulders on top of you, so you'll have to step away from them, and then two boulders will spawn, and you'll have to stand next to them when he hurls a massive rock to you. And if you don't stand next to one of those boulders when he hurls that rock at you, you will take probably about 40 damage. If you're playing with two players or more, you'll each have to spread yourselves out, to your own boulders. So if you're playing with three people, then there's going to be a boulder with half health. One person goes to the half health boulder, and two people will go to the full health boulder, and so on. When he's at two-thirds of his health, he's going to throw these boulders down, or these, these giant, I guess they are, boulders. Everything's a boulder in this boss fight. And we can skip this phase, but to try to keep things a little bit less complicated, we're going to just switch to our range weapon and shoot the cracked boulder with two players that should die in two hits. I think solo that cracked boulder will die in one hit with a ranged weapon. And then you just walk between it. And that is it. That's the entire fight. We do that two more times and you'll be completed with Baba. He is one of the easier bosses in my opinion. He's much easier than the monkey room before it. In fact, the monkey room almost feels like the boss itself. And I actually think a baboon did spawn there, so sometimes monkeys will spawn from 
the ceiling, and my friend and I always make it a priority to kill those baboons that spawn. They have 35 health at this level, they usually die pretty quick, and the reason we want to kill them is because they will attack the sarcophagi on the sides of the arena, and if those sarcophagi die, they will start spewing out rocks at you, and it's pretty easy to dodge these rocks, but it's just something else you don't really want to deal with. Now with the invocations I have turned on, when we kill those baboons, they will drop a banana on the ground. So maybe there weren't any baboons. I don't know, I actually missed it. <laughs> if there was one, maybe we didn't kill it. Because if we kill a baboon, a banana will drop on the ground. And just like Mario Kart, if you step on the banana, it will cause you to slip. So it's kind of funny, but it's really easy to avoid. And when we're in the final phase, ignore any baboons. Do not ignore the rock hurling mechanic though. And put on Piety if you have the prayer. You can pray magic or pray melee if he's attacking you. He will hit through prayer. If you're playing solo and it feels like he's hitting you pretty hard, then you can try to, you, you could turn off that quiet prayers invocation I have on. I think that's the one that causes attacks to go through prayer a little bit more. Uh, but when you're playing solo, the bosses have a lot less health, so it's really not too big of a deal. And that is it for Baba. We're going to start Kefri's path next. The next path we're going to be doing is Scarabus, Bug Path, Kefri Path, and I decided to do this one live because it'll be a little bit easier to show all the puzzles this way, and this is how you're going to solve it when you are solo. So when we walk in here, first make sure that you also have the Tombs of a Masket Puzzle Helper enabled. That's going to make this room a joke. We have two pathways, and if you're playing co-op, one of you is going to pick one pathway and the other person will pick the other pathway, but to do it solo, what we're going to do is click on the quick pass barrier, and there's this ancient button at the beginning we're going to click, and the puzzle solver is going to solve this for us. So this is a, mem ah, a memory puzzle, and we're going to click on the one and then the two, and make sure that you don't click on the other buttons until you get there, so then the three and then the four, and then the five, and this one will be solved. Eventually, these scarabs are going to spawn. With full melee armor on, you can probably ignore them at this level. You don't have to pray range. But if you don't want to take any damage here, just pray range. If you're solo, or if your friend needs help, you're going to want to crawl through the passage here. And this is the only puzzle that this puzzle helper can't actually solve, because it's a stupid guessing game. So we got to click on it and avoid these rocks that fall down if you click on the wrong obelisk and the puzzle helper will still tell us that we have the right one hit there so that's the right order that's pillar number one sorry i'm having a hard time figuring out what to call these things and it looks like we're just going to get the absolute worst possible sequence that we can here yep it's just going to be the last pillar every time this is how they all go Okay, there's three, four, and there's five. Cool. Once both of these puzzles are solved, we can walk into the next room. So we're going to click on the ancient tablet. Once again, the puzzle helper will tell us which ones we need to step on. So we're just going to run across the lit up squares. And once that one's done, we can jump to the platform here. And I can't actually see these red colors very well, so I'm going to hide it behind the blackness, and I can see that we have to step on these squares. And this will solve these ones for us too. This is a matching game, so solo, some of these are going to be solved for us, and we need to open up all of these just to make it a little bit easier. And we're going to run over here and open them all up again. Again, the puzzle helper is what will remember what the squares are. And the last one we opened was W, so we're going to run over here and open up W. And we're going to do that until all of them are lit up. When you're with a friend, one of you will be on this side, the other will be on that side, and you'll just call out which ones you need to match. Once all of them are matched, you will be able to enter the room to Kefri. Kefri is one of the bosses that I found pretty hard to learn because there's a lot going on, but she ended up being one of the easier ones once we did learn her. So the first thing we're going to do is jump inside. We shouldn't have lost really any health from that puzzle room. And if you're using thralls, then you'll want to use probably the ranger thrall. And we shouldn't have to pray hardly at all throughout this fight. The main attack that we have to watch out for is dung strike. It's this attack she'll shoot out throughout the entirety of the fight. And it will create a 3x3 grid of shadows that we want to step out of once the shadows show up. 
it's really important that you don't move until the shadows appear. Do not preemptively move, you will mess it up. Eventually, she's going to summon some flies that will appear around you. If you have your sound on, you can hear these, otherwise you'll just have to pay attention, but you'll know because there's no dung strike coming out. And we're going to want to move into this highlighted square that I have here. I don't think this is in any of the tile packs. This is a square that I highlighted. And once the dung hits both of us, and both of us need to be on the same square, then a pile of dung is going to cut off parts of the arena, and we have to be really careful on how we place the dung here. And this is so we can cut off this side of the arena, so we can trap off the melee scarab that she will summon after her second health bar. She's also going to summon these eggs, I think this is called mass incubation, we're going to ignore them. You can click on the dark ones if you don't want the little scarab beetles to attack you, but they don't do that much damage and you can pray range to negate all the damage that they do. Once our first health bar is down, a ranger will spawn here and you'll want to pray range, put on piety, and kill it as fast as possible. You may have noticed this already, but during Kefri's downed phase, we will have these scarab dive bombing beetles that will attack us and leave a 3x3 grid around us, so be sure to step out of those. Next, she's going to be summoning a bunch of these scarab swarms that will heal her shield up. So if you have a blowpipe, which I don't have, <laughs> this is much easier than with a bofa or a melee weapon, but we're going to try our best to destroy as many of these scarab swarms as we can. If you're solo, this is a little bit less intense, I think. Maybe I'm just confirmation biasing myself there, I don't know. Uh, so you can often get her to her health bar to be pretty low in her second phase if you defeat enough of those swarms, but especially your first couple of times, don't worry too much about that. That swarm attacking will come with time as you understand the mechanics of her a little bit better. She's going to summon another dung pile here. Like I said, there will be flies that summon around you and you can also hear like a little fly noise if you have your sound on. Once her second health bar is depleted, she will summon a melee scarab and a major scarab. It's very important that you kill the major as quickly as possible. If it spawns here, it's going to do something like 60 damage to you. I don't actually know how much, I haven't been hit by it too often. And once we're done with that, we see the melee scarab beetle is trapped, so we don't have to worry about him. Now keep in mind, the melee scare beetle will continuously heal Kefri, so if you want, you could just not trap him at all, and you could kill him with also melee attacks. You will pray melee if he's attacking you. The melee scarab is really not that big of a deal. My friend and I have actually just started killing him instead of trapping him, so it's kind of up to you how you want to do this. And once phase two is completed, we're on her third health bar now, we just have to dodge the dung strike. We want to move over to the corner here every time she's going to summon more dung piles onto us because we just want to try not to trap ourselves off to the rest of the arena. And we're really trying to stay on the same square. And that is what makes this boss a little bit more difficult if you're playing with multiple people. If you guys are on separate squares, then these dung piles that she's throwing out at us are going to cut off the other players from the other parts of the arena and you might get into a situation where you can't really do anything to her. It's really annoying if you get this part messed up and this fight can fall apart very quickly but once you guys kind of get into your synchronized swimming and you know what you're supposed to be doing she's a pretty easy boss and you shouldn't use hardly any resources at all on her. After you defeat two bosses, a helpful spirit will appear inside of this main room, and if you forget to talk to him, don't worry, the game will warn you before it allows you to go into another boss room. He has three supply bundles, life, chaos, and power. So all of these items have their own name, but I'm going to try to call them what we're used to, just so we don't get too confused here. These are Ceridomen Brews. These are Super Restores. These are one-click instant heals that includes your health, your stats, your run energy, cures poison, all that good stuff. These are continuous prayer regeneration. I don't have any right now that are showing up, but these silk dressings are continuous health regeneration. These are overloads, they're called smelling salts. 
And this is an adrenaline. This is continuous special attack restoration, and it makes your special attack cost half as much as it normally would. We're not going to worry about the adrenaline, but it is super useful once you get better at the raid. I'm going to take Chaos, because I really want the Smelling Salts for Akka. It makes the fight go a lot smoother, but if this is your first time attempting this raid, don't worry too much about what supplies you grab here. As I said before, you're probably throwing your head against the wall and relying on Honey Locusts anyway. The next boss we'll be defeating is Akka. In Akka's puzzle room, we'll notice immediately that there is a statue that is holding a bronze pickaxe. If you can, I recommend that you get a dragon pickaxe and you store it here before you start the raid. It'll remain here until you pick it up again. And I'm going to take it out here, and when you're doing this raid for real, you're going to want at least two free inventory spaces while you're doing this, so you'll just drop any supplies in here if you have to free up space. And then we're going to equip the pickaxe and enter into the room. I should have mentioned this when I was inside the room, but that's okay. We'll want the Akka Puzzle, TOA Akka Puzzle Tile Pack. And this is from the Tile Packs extension that I recommended earlier. And this tile pack will give us these numbered tiles here that are helpful in telling you where you should put these mirrors to redirect the beam of light. So what we're doing here is we're trying to get the light from that statue to this one. And we have to use the mirrors to do so. There's going to be some barriers in our way. We can mine those just by mining them. And this one I can already tell we're just going to use three. So it looks like we can use the three, three, and there's a mirror in place for us right there. And there are three mirrors we can pick up. So there's one up there, one down there, and one in that corner. So we'll pick up this mirror. We're trying to avoid these orbs of darkness because they hurt you kind of a lot. And we will put the mirror down here. If it would actually click through, there we go. And if we right click it, we can rotate it. So we want it to reflect the light into that statue. So that's the direction we will set the rotation. And then I'm going to go pick up the second mirror. With friends, this goes a lot quicker. And once you do this puzzle room a few times, it goes pretty quick too. And I'm not going to put the mirror down right on that square because that beam of light will also hurt you. So I'm going to put it down next to it and get the mirror ready. And this way I can just right click it and push it into the square that we want. Now the goal we're going for is to destroy this seal in one attempt. It might take you two. And what determines the damage that you do to this seal, I'm not 100% sure, but it seems to be based on your pickaxe level. So the highest level pickaxe, whether that's a dragon pickaxe or a crystal pickaxe, that's what you'll want to use. And have at least 85 mining or have 82 mining where the dragon pickaxe special can boost your level to 85. It seems that the damage to the seal is done in tiers, and 85 is the so-called last tier of damage, where you should be hitting like 18s and 19s. I'm not totally sure how that works, but if you want to try to get this done in one hit, then try to go for the higher mining level and the higher pickaxe. So we're going to push this into place, use our special, and as the beam comes out, we're going to click on this, and that may have missed it. We're going to try to move out of the way of these orbs of darkness. We don't want to take the damage, and I'm pretty certain I'm not going to get this in one try because it took me too long to click it, and I stepped out of the way of the orb. And then we just have to repeat this. So let's take a look at what it wants us to do. It kind of looks like it's a four, but this wall is in the way. So it's actually more like a one. So I'm going to grab this mirror. And I'm going to come up here and place the mirror, and that's good. And then I can put this one over here, once that's out of the way. Okay, and then let's get this one. And we will need to break the barrier here. Whoops. Okay, those are all in place, so now we can push this one into place. And we'll definitely destroy the seal this time. 
Once that's done, be sure to pick up any supplies if you dropped any, and you can store your pickaxe at any of those statue deposits that you see around the puzzle room. And this is sped up, but this is how my friend and I looked when we completed this puzzle room during this raid. Time for Akka. This boss is definitely one of the harder ones to learn, but once you get him down, in my opinion, he's one of the easier bosses just because he's so rigid. We're going to switch to all of our mage gear, and we're going to use smelling salts if we have them. If you don't have them, don't worry about it. Fair warning, this is kind of a sloppy Akka kill, but it does sort of show all the stuff that can go wrong here, and you can still get a kill off of him, no problem. We're going to start with maging him and praying melee. He will hit you through melee, whether or not you have quiet prayers on. And once you do enough damage to him, he's going to summon these statues in the quadrants around the arena, and there's going to be a timer on the hourglass. We need to kill these statues before that timer and the hourglass fills up. The safest way to do this is to range it, but if it's early enough here, then you can switch to your melee gear and you can melee them down too. I don't know what these statues are weakest to, but killing them with range or melee seems really effective. It was kind of hard to see because he's standing in the statue right now, but when he switches attack styles, he will slam his staff on the ground. We'll see that a little bit later. But more interestingly here, you notice my friend and I are glowing white. So this is another effect that will happen from time to time. You'll glow either white or black. If you're glowing white, you want to make sure that you are not standing parallel to your friend. You want to stand adjacent to them. And that is not what happens here because in my efforts to move Akka out of the way of the statue, I actually stand right next to my friend and then I shoot him with this debuff that Akka gave us. And that disabled our prayer. So neither one of us actually turned our prayer back on. We should be praying at range right now. And as you can tell, it's not actually doing that much damage. We were getting a pretty lucky though. It does a lot of damage. And we're in the melee stage, so we're swapped to our melee gear and we're going to melee Akka. My friend caught that the prayer should be on before I did. There's the staff slam and now we need to pray magic. We are now glowing black, that is okay, we just have to sit still, and when you move around, as we see here, we're going to leave these orbs behind, and as long as you don't walk on them, they're not really that big of a deal. And then we're going to run over and destroy the statue in this corner of the arena, and once that's dead, we want to make sure that we can drag him into the quadrant so he's actually weak. He slammed his staff into the ground there again, but this time it's Simon Says. When he does Simon Says, the symbols in the middle of the arena are going to start to glow, and you can call them out just for your own sanity if you want to. So in this case, the order is Skull, Lightning Bolt, Star, Fire. You want to make sure that you step in that quadrant, but you don't want to do it too early like I did there. Like I said, this is a pretty sloppy Akka kill. And then we're going to correctly step into the safe quadrants here. Once the final one blows up, we're going to run into the quadrant where he can be attacked because he is invulnerable in the other quadrants with those statues. And we're back on melee. So what order do his attacks go in? Well, he always starts with melee and then he just goes right to left on the prayer book. So he goes melee, range, magic, melee, range, magic. You're going to pray, melee, range, magic, and then you're going to attack him with whatever those are weak to. So magic, melee, ranged. That doesn't make any sense when I'm saying it, but it'll make sense when you play this. You just need basic knowledge of the combat triangle, which hopefully you have by now. And that's the entire Akka fight. We have to do that four times for the four different quadrants. He does have an enrage phase, so I will describe that once we get there.
Once his enrage begins, switch to your melee gear, put on protect for magic and piety, and you're going to try to hit him hard so you can kill him as fast as possible. Thralls here are bad, and fast attacks are bad, because the more he gets hit, the quicker he'll switch quadrants. And we want to try to avoid that, because we see these little magic whirlwinds flying around. One of them actually ends up killing me, because I was not paying good enough attention. That's okay, my friend got it. The prey magic will reduce the damage that those things do, but they still hurt a lot. And he killed him right at the end. I died right at the end, so I'm going to keep this kill in the tutorial. I don't know why this kill ended up being so sloppy. Whatever, let's move on. Zabak is next. Now for Zabak's puzzle room. This is different raid footage because I wasn't happy with the other one, but let's move on from that. And the purpose of this room is that we have to take this water bucket and fill it up with water from one of the water sources at the other end of these swampy pathways, and then water the tree in the center of the room. We're in mage gear because there's going to be a crocodile that will show up that we're going to mage. So what we're going to do is grab the water bottle, or the water bucket, and there's some marked tiles at the end of both of these swampy pathways. We're going to stand on the furthest marked tile here and then try to click once on the other side of the swampy pathway, and we should run all the way across and not take any damage. And if we did this correctly, we should put 100 resources into that tree. Then we're going to wait for a crocodile to spawn around the corner. Only one of you has to wait here, but if you don't kill it in time, then it will attack the tree and reduce the amount of water that's in that tree. Then we repeat that, and I think one of us still gets hit doing this, but it's pretty much the same exact thing. You should only have to do this four times if you are playing with two people, or twice if you're playing solo, assuming of course neither one of you get hit. I got hit there on the way back, so one of us is going to have to go back and finish off the remaining 50 resources, and then we can head to the back. Time for Zabak, who many people think is the easiest boss. I disagree. I think he's not the easiest. He's not the hardest, but he's not the easiest. Optionally, we can run in here and whack him with a special attack like a BGS to try to lower his defense. He's going to start spitting out attacks, and we're going to have to swap prayers kind of like Jad. And this is his ranged attack when he throws a rock, and this one is his magic attack when he throws a pot. My suggestion here is not to switch prayers until that pot or that rock explode. This will help you out a lot in his enrage phase. Until then, you're just going to hit max range, put on rigor, and try to hit him as much as you can until he does his first special attack. So here's one of them. He'll spit out all this poison with a couple of these water jugs, and then up north we're going to see there's these waves that come down. Sometimes they spawn to the south, or that is the south, sometimes they spawn to the north, but you know what I mean. And kind of like Baba's rocks, we need to step between them. Focus on staying alive here. You still have to switch prayers. Don't focus on damaging him unless you think you can get it out. So be really mindful of the range of your ranged weapon. You might attack him thinking that you're safe, and then you get dragged in front of the wave and get killed. His second special attack is similar to the first one. He spits out a bunch of poison and water jugs, but he also spits out these rocks. We need to go behind one of the water jugs and push or pull it toward the direction of the rock and then blow it up so it will clear the poison. This way we can stand behind the rocks and kill him no problem. In a second here, he's going to do a special attack, and it's going to clear the whole arena. And if I pause this here, we can see that there's actually some clear spaces, three spaces behind each rock. Those are all safe spaces, but if you're anywhere else, this will kill you. And that's the entirety of the fight until he hits his enrage phase. With the invocations that we have on, one that you want to be mindful of is blood magic. If you're playing with a friend, you want to make sure that you're both spread apart so the blood magic is pretty much worthless. Right there he did blood magic and nothing happened to us. 
and we're just going to repeat the successful completion of his mechanics until his enrage phase starts. So once he's at about 25% health, his enrage will begin, and he's not going to do any more special attacks. He'll still do blood magic, but he won't do any more of those poison casting attacks. And he's also going to spit out his attacks much quicker. And this is why I said earlier, you don't want to switch prayers until that rock or that pot explode. The reason for that is because we're waiting for that attack to actually hit us before we prayer swap. If you prayer swap too early, you're going to die and wonder why that's happening. And sadly, we're not going to get to see the full effect here, but the other invocation we have on will spawn these weird little blood clots that are going to show up in a second. If these things show up earlier for you, just kite them around. Don't let them stand on you because they will siphon your health. That's it for the back. We're now done with all four bosses and we're ready to grab the life supply. That's the one I'm going to grab from the helpful spirit. And then we can head on into the wardens. But before that, let me talk a little bit about inventory management. Thanks to the menu entry swap our runelight plugin, there is an easier way to manage our supplies from our supply pouch. This can be done by holding shift and then right clicking our supply pouch and we want to swap the shift click or the left click to resupply. What this will allow us to do is to have only one nectar, cerebrew, and only one of any other of our supplies that comes out of this pouch and then we can hold shift click or we can press shift click on that pouch and it will automatically resupply any of the other supplies that we have in our inventory. So this will work for our Ceridoma brews, our super restores, our ambrosias, whatever is in the pouch. If there's something that it can draw from the resupply in our inventory, then that shift click resupply will do that. You can also get to resupply from right clicking the pouch, but the shift click or the left click is a lot harder to misclick. All right, final boss time, the Wardens. The Wardens are split up into three phases. There's a lot going on, so expect a lot of pauses and a lot of talking. First of all, organize your inventory. It's going to be pretty hard to get through the Wardens without using any resources. If this is your first time doing this raid, you more than likely are capable of getting through all the other bosses without using anything except Honey Locusts, but here, unless you actually died like 15 times to them, you're going to want to use other resources to keep yourself alive throughout the Wardens. That does mean you might actually die enough times on the Wardens that you run out of resources and you have to repeat the raid. That is part of raiding, but that's okay. If you made it this far, that is tremendous progress, and you're almost there. For my inventory, I made sure to withdraw my Ceridoman Brew and my Super Restore, along with my Ambrosia. I have a Smelling Salt out. If you don't have a Smelling Salt, that's okay, but they are really helpful here. And if you have a Silk Dressing, they are super useful for Phase 2 of the Wardens. I don't have any, so I'm going to be using my Scarab, which will give me Continuous Prayer Regen. Do not use the Ambrosia until you are in Phase 3. That's where it's, that's what it's used for, is Phase 3 Wardens. Up until then, you should be fine just using Cerebrews and Super Restores. These tiles I have marked, I don't think are in a tile pack, but these are the ones that I do suggest that you mark yourself. This tile is really important, and you're probably going to want to mark this tile over here too. We're going to be dancing back and forth between these two tiles once Phase 2 begins. And these two tiles are useful just to kind of remind you where you're, where you're supposed to stand. You'll notice there's these little rivers that run from the center obelisk to the two wardens on the left and the right side of my screen here. We need to block off some of the energy that will be going to one of those wardens. And what that will do is damage you, but it will also determine which warden we're going to be fighting in phase two. We need to stand in the energy long enough that we offset the UFOs that are going to show up a little bit later. So this way they're not attacking us at the same time. This will make more sense once I start playing the video. And the warden we're going to be choosing is the warden on the right side, so we need to block the energy on the left side. This will also determine which bosses appear for you in phase 3. I'll explain that a little bit more once we get there though. 
When you're ready to begin, you will talk to the ghost. All of you will have to ready up against the ghost, and then we can get started. We moved into position. I'm going to use my smelling salts, and I have my spec weapon ready, which is my BGS. Again, if you don't have that, don't worry about it. And we're going to hit the pillar once to try to, or the obelisk wants to try to reduce its defense. Spike my mango is the one blocking the energy going to the left ward in there. And soon some red UFOs are going to drop down and we're not going to move at all when they come here. We can sit in that square that I'm in and spike my mango. Whoever's on the side can stand in the corner there and they won't get hit. Once these UFOs come down, now we have to move, and if you're using thralls, ranged thralls are really good here. The warden on the right side is going to shoot these orbs at you. You need to be spread apart for these, and it does just a guaranteed 19 damage. Can't avoid it. The warden on the left is going to throw these bigger orbs at you. You need to stand together to reduce the damage to these ones that these ones do, and they will only do about 4 damage at this difficulty. Once the obelisk is dead, and keep in mind these mechanics will repeat until the obelisk is dead, we need to switch to our mage gear, and then we're going to run over to the square. Phase 2 is the tricky one. If you are the one blocking the energy to the other warden, then you've likely taken a significant amount of damage, and the small free time that you get between phase 1 and 2 is a good time to heal up. That goes for any of the other players, because you are going to be taking all that damage from those orbs that these wardens will send at you while you're attacking the obelisk. You'll notice the health bar for the warden starts at zero. As we attack the warden, the health bar will fill up, and for the first time, this health bar gets filled up, we're going to start with magic, and we're going to attack the entirety of this first health bar with magic. After that, we're going to switch to range, and then just go back and forth until phase two is completed. This obelisk in the center will periodically summon one of three special attacks. I'll go through those as we run into them. And we also have to prayer swap against the warden. His magic attack looks like a skull, and his ranged attack looks like a rock, and they both make distinctly different noises, so keep your sounds on, they are really helpful in this raid. Randomly, the warden might disable your prayer and then send either a magic, a ranged, or a melee attack at you, and you will have to pray appropriately. It can get pretty hectic trying to do all of this in the middle of all the other special attacks, so be deliberate, don't panic, and you'll defeat him in no time. So we're in our mage gear, and we're standing on the right square, and the warden comes out, and we're going to start immediately attacking it. The first attack he does is ranged, because of course it is. The second one is ranged, and this is what we're going to do until that obelisk in the center starts to have a temper tantrum. That one was a magic attack. And the first special attack it's doing is the converging beam here. So you have to keep switching prayers, and then we're going to click back here into that square, and wait for the beam to come back, and then just return to this square. This prevents you from having to run all around the arena figuring out how to dodge this stuff. This is one of those prayer disabling special attacks that I mentioned before. I don't think we get too many of these in this fight, but this is the ranged version, so he will turn your prayers off, and then he will send a white arrow at you. If it was magic, it would be a blue orb, and if it was melee, it would be a red scimitar. I unfortunately can't find pictures of those anywhere, so you'll just have to figure it out by the colors. It's pretty straightforward, you'll figure it out no problem. Pay attention to his health bar. When his health is at about 90%, you're going to want to start switching into your melee gear. And that is what we're doing here. And you're going to want to switch into all of your melee gear that gives you a strength bonus, and also your dragon dagger, and then turn piety on. This goes very quickly, and it's a little erratic at first, but once you get it down a few times, it's not too big of a deal. We want to try to be ready before this core hits the ground, and we want our prayer on, so set your quick prayers to piety. We want our special attack ready to go, we want our weapon, our dragon dagger, to be on the strength setting, and we want all of our melee gear on, and once the core hits the ground, we need to attack it as quickly as we can. We're trying to get his health bar, this is his real health bar, down to two-thirds or less. We are going to three-phase this warden in this video, that means phase two is going to take us three attempts to move on to phase three. But if you are really on top of it, if you're using adrenaline and you're just a little bit better than we are, then you can easily get this done in two phases. Once his core goes back into his chest, phase two will begin. 
or phase two of phase two, I guess. You know what I mean. And we're going to switch to our ranged gear and just repeat everything that we did. We need to watch out for these stones. I actually get hit by both of these, so let's pretend that didn't happen. When these stones come out, they will petrify you. They will also turn off your prayer. You can get out of them just by clicking away rapidly until you're free. The special attack from this obelisk is the pinwheel as we're seeing, and we dodge that the exact same way that we dodge the converging beams that we saw earlier. You are more than likely going to have to heal during this phase of the fight just because he does a lot of chip damage through prayer, whether or not you have the quiet prayers invocation on. So don't be afraid to use your resources here, there's really no better time, but unless it's an absolute emergency, don't use your ambrosia until phase 3, that's where the real emergencies begin. We got his second core out. I was a little bit slow on the gear swap here, but that's okay. We're still doing all right. And then we're just going to take it down as far as we can get it. We almost two-phased him. I didn't think we were going to, but we almost two-phased him. If I wasn't as slow as I was, we actually might have. But that's okay. That means I get to show you the third special attack from the obelisk, which is the skulls. And this is th definitely the worst one. This is the one that kills a lot of teams. And here we're going to see, at least it kills all the teams I'm on. So here we see the obelisk having its temper tantrum and the skull is coming out. So that skull on that side of the arena is not a big deal. It's not going to affect us. But this skull right here is a big deal. It will hurt us and it will also disable your prayers if it hits you. So we have two options. We can either stand in the two squares adjacent to the shadow. So that's northwest, southeast of it or we can just run away from it. I opted to run away from this skull, and we still need a prayer swap. That skull, I got really lucky. It landed right where it needed to land for me to not get hit by it, and then I'm just going to avoid these other skulls, and the rest of them stayed mostly away from us. That's definitely the worst attack that the Phase 2 Warden has, and if you can get through the skulls, you can manage the other ones just fine, and it's just a matter of swapping gear and prayer until you get his core out enough times that you can actually defeat him and send him into Phase 3. This is another good time to heal up, and when you're done healing up, you'll want to switch to your ranged gear, and then we're going to move on to the right side of the arena real quick here, because the third warden phase is going to use his hands to pull up the floor and cause a shockwave of tiles, and then we're going to move from the right to the left to the middle, then right, left, middle, right, left, middle, and do that the entirety of this fight until he gets to his enrage phase. My friend, again, is using ruby bolts. They do the enchanted ruby bolts. They're really great because they will whack him with hundreds. The bofa is pretty good. It seems to do pretty consistent 40s on the guy. And if you are going to be using thralls, we're going to summon those too. We don't have to worry about prayer yet. We will soon. If you have the awareness to do so, you can try to hit him with some special attacks of whatever weapon that you have. And we're going to do this until he summons these skulls. We're going to switch to a melee weapon and attack these skulls, and they should die in one hit. If you're on harder difficulties with harder groups, then you'll probably have to hit them more than once. And if you're on your own, there will be less skulls that spawn than that will spawn when you're playing with two players. You can also click the skulls sooner than you think you can. That'll make more sense when you do it yourself, but you can click the next one quicker than you think you're allowed to. And then we're going to repeat that same thing. Keep your thralls up if you're using them. They do help a lot. They're like an extra 100 damage or something like that throughout the entirety of their lifespan. So they are very useful, but they're not 100% necessary. The second time he summons skulls, Zabak, we notice, is going to spawn in the left side there. And he's going to start spitting out his attacks like he did when we were fighting him normally. So now you have to keep an eye out on his attacks. My friend and I try to keep a hold of this just by saying his attacks every time they come out. That means that both of us know for sure what we need to pray, and it's pretty easy to kind of get messed up because this fight gets a little hectic, even though it's totally manageable and much easier than phase two in my opinion. It can get a little hectic and you can forget that you're supposed to prayer swap against Zabak there. So keep your sound on, pay attention to the sound, look in his direction every now and then, make sure you're not messing up the prayers. When this, uh, are these the third skulls? When these skulls show up, then Baba will appear on the right side, and he is going to just throw boulders at us. All we have to do for those is don't stand in the same square for too long. Really not a big deal. 
And now the fight is going to stay exactly the same until we get the warden into his enrage phase. We have one more round of skulls. Keep an eye on your prayer. Keep an eye on your prayer switches. And the home stretch begins. The arena will continuously get smaller. Eventually, it will only become a single row if you let it go on long enough. So try to hit him with everything you've got. If you have special, good special attack weapons, this is a good time. And we still have to move to avoid Baba and prayer switch the back's attacks. And I don't do this very well, but it's best if you wait for the shadows to appear and then click on a free square before you move, because these lightning bolts will hit you pretty quickly and they tend to do about 10 to 15 damage or so. It's pretty easy to take a lot of damage here without really meaning to take a lot of damage, so this is where you're going to use your Ambrosia if you need to heal up. You can heal with Ceridoma Brewers here, no problem, but Ambrosias are those one-click heals where you're saving the entire fight, so use them here if you need them. Then you're just going to keep attacking him until he dies. Once the Warden is defeated, we can head into the Rewards Room. So let's talk a little bit about how the rewards work. If you are paying attention to this TOA points I have down here above my chat bar, you'll notice that the points have been going up the more damage that I've done. And that's how the points, your unique percentage chance, are determined. The more damage you do, the more points that you get. And the more points you have, the higher chance you have at getting a unique. This sarcophagus here will glow purple if one of you gets a unique. The whole raid group can only get one unique, and everyone will see that this sarcophagus is glowing purple. The rest of you, or if you don't get any uniques at all, will see a key in front of these chests around the sides of the room, and the one with the key in it is the one you're going to go to to get your rewards. It should go without saying, but dying is bad. The more you die, the less points you're going to have. If your points drop too low, you're going to get a steaming fossilized dung as a reward. You won't get any drops at all. And if this is your first time completing this raid, that's probably what you're going to get. Like I said at the beginning of this raid, your chief concern needs to be completing it. You can worry about finishing the raid with minimal deaths as you get better at the mechanics, but just focus on finishing it once. And if you made it this far and you got your fossilized dung, that's awesome. At least you completed the raid once, and each completion after that is going to get easier and easier. And that's the end of my tutorial on the Tombs of a Masket in Old School RuneScape. I tried to include all the information, or most of the information, that I felt was missing from other guides. So I hope this was helpful to somebody, and thanks for watching.